Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Metal Magdalena with Jet right here on Metal Messiah Radio. Tonight, we have a special guest with us back on the show. We have Eric Rutan of death metal band Hate Eternal. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Jet, thank you so much for having me back, and uh, glad I made the, the special guest. <laughs> you're, category. You're, I appreciate that. You're always our special guest, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been called special in many ways in my life. It's sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes who knows what. So, but I know if it's coming from you, then it means something good. So. Absolutely. So, so Haiti Turtle has a new album coming out on October 26th off a of Season of Mist Records called Des- Upon Desolate Sands. But before we get into that, Eric, as many of us broken-hearted Patriots fans know, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl earlier this year, and a couple of months ago, Decibel Magazine posted like your metal version of Fly Eagles Fly. So tell us, what kind of emotions went into making that little metal version song, Eric? Arguably the highlight of my career, maybe. I'm not sure, (laughs) but... uh... (laughs) <laughs> Just kidding. But, but uh, yeah, that was, I mean, you know, to be an Eagles fan for, you know, my whole life since I was, I don't know, eight years old or something following, starting to enjoy football. Um, man, my whole life I've just said, you know, the Eagles could just win one. I mean, you know, would I like five like that dynasty you got going on up there? <laughs> sure, but, you know, it, it, as an Eagles fan, I know any Eagles fan out there, uh, can understand this is that you know we keep modest wants in, in, in what we hope for the Eagles and uh, JJ you know my bass player and I we always talk about uh, the one thing that always kills us year in and year out is hope so we always try to keep expect the worst hope for the best um, and you know obviously winning the Super Bowl was uh, man it's just a, a, one of the things in my whole life I always said Dan if, if the Eagles could just win one Super Bowl in my lifetime I will be so goddamn happy about it. And <laughs> last year, or, or this, well, you know, February fourth, of course, mm-hmm. this, this was my this was my year to win. And JJ and I have been speaking about it for years. I said, man, I want to do a metal version of the Eagles fight song. And once we won the Super Bowl, I knew that <laughs> no more excuses, man. I had to get this thing rolling, and uh, I just went in there and tried to transpose like an idea. I just was trying to create like a Metallica eyes version of the fight song, you know. Uh, so I went in there, played a little marching snare and then tracked the guitars and, and bass and then overdubbed um, the fight song from the link, you know, like 70,000 people singing it. And also I blended that in with the Philadelphia Eagles um, parade that, of course, as soon as the Eagles one, I hopped on a plane the next day, flew up to visit family in Jersey, and then hooked up with Jason, and we went to the parade in Philly the next day. So I, I merged the singing of the fight song from the link and from the parade all into this metalized version. So uh, obviously a, a highlight of of the year for me. No, maybe maybe of a lifetime at this point. So, <laughs> well, I know. I know. It was one of those songs I knew that the majority of people are just completely going to hate, and at the same time, it just gave me that much more love for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, probably will never happen again, but at least... <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's hard. You know, you know what? You might be right on that, considering um, we're, not, we're not playing such great ball this year, but uh, I always keep the pace a little bit, you know, I, I'm hoping... Okay. I'm a diehard Eagles fan, whether we lose or win, and so if we only get one in my lifetime, at least I can go to my grave knowing we got the, we got the little party. And if we get another one, oh my God, I don't know what I'd do with myself. I'd, I'd lose my mind. <laughs> well, you just keep that mentality of expect the worst and hope for the best, and you should be okay. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I, you know, it's got me by in life pretty well so far, so I'm going to stick to my guns on it. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to uh, back to the music now. So, so Eric, also being like a producer and in the business of music and recording and that for so many years, with the death metal scene the way it is, what 
element or something in death metal do you think that maybe death metal is is lacking nowadays? Well, I, I mean, I think well, the, the funny thing is, is like death metal in so many ways has so much now uh, because it's it's diversified and expanded in many ways with so many different um, subgenres and things that I can't even keep track of. I learn something new every day, uh, whether it's terminology or, or subgenres. But I guess the one, if I had to pinpoint one thing that I really try to emphasize with Hate Eternal is um, that kind of lacks in a lot of more modern death metal productions is kind of like that aura or vibe of natural, authentic performances and, and tones and unique uh, variables of tones. Kind of like, you know, for me, I always always go back to some of my favorite sounding metal records back in the day, like Ride the Lightning or Master of Puppets, mm-hmm. you know, like they, they had some, they had a very unique sound to them and like an aura about them and a certain vibe. And, you know, you could kind of hear, yeah, you know, I, I use authenticity all the time. It's like something that I really try to capture with Eternal is the authenticity of the performers and really try to capture that special moment and get the best performances out of uh, the musicians, whether it's Hannes, JJ, or myself. And sometimes that gets lost in translation a little bit in modern production because, um, you know, so much is, you know, edited and over over-edited and overproduced, and I guess I, I think that one thing that tends to get lost now in, in a lot of modern death metal production is just that sense of, of natural humanistic flaws that kind of make something special with music, you know, and when you listen back on metal records and some of my favorite death metal records, well, they weren't perfect, you know, they had flaws, and that's kind of what creates uh, great music, in, in in my opinion, and that's something that I try to I try to capture like a very, um, you know, I guess high fidelity sound, but also trying to keep the authenticity of the performances and the vibe and character of the band and the individuals as well as the collective. And sometimes that gets lost in a lot of modern production, I think, because. In some records, I don't even know if they use real drums or not, or they're editing the drums to sound like a drum machine. Or, um, you know, for me, I like to try different amps and different approaches for every album because I look at every band uniquely. Because no band that I work with sounds exactly the same, so I really like to try new things um, instead of just like you know having a couple of presets on a plugin or a temper or something like that. You know, if some guy comes in with some weird tube amp from '86. And he says, hey, you know, I want to use this amp. Let's mic it up. I'm like, great. I'm excited because I always <laughs> want to try new things. So I think um, the uniqueness and, and authenticity of bands, uh, I think sometimes gets a little lost. But at the same token, you know, that's just my opinion. You know, I mean, I, you know what they say about opinions. So <laughs> I think a lot of the modern sound really fits a lot of the more um, technical, savvy bands at the same time. But what I really enjoy about metal and the records that I like to produce or record and listen to are bands where you can just kind of feel it pulling and pushing and you can kind of hear that the characteristics of the band and, and, and the identity of the musicians. And, and sometimes that gets lost, I think, with overproduced modern production. And now you had also just mentioned about Hannes Grossman, um, Upon Desolate Sands, you've added him to the mix. So what does he bring to the band, and has having him in the band like changed the dynamic at all? Well, Honest is, is a man. He's a consummate professional, um, absolute hardworking, dedicated, motivated guy. And um, what's funny is, you know, leading up to the record, you know, we hired Honest to do some tours for Infernus not really knowing um, how it would go further because I, I mean, these days I look at everything as one record at a time, one tour at a time, one day at a time, mm-hmm. really, you know, it's, it's like, so as you get older, you just kind of value and appreciate things in a different way. And with Hannes, as we did, I think, four tours together for Infernus, when it came down to doing the record, JJ and I just thought, man, we should, should ask Hannes if he'd like to do the record. Um, and we and we did, and, and he was totally excited about it. <laughs> One thing about Hannes, he's always up for the 
a challenge. And she came here. We, we set songs back and forth for months um, as JJ and I were uh, putting the songs together and we send them the click track and scratch guitars and he would record drum ideas back and forth from his studio. And then he came here for a month mm-hmm. and we did a lot of practicing pre-production demos until we were ready and then record. Um, and the thing is with Hannes, I mean, Hannes has, he has a few bands, he has a production career, he also does other people's radio. So he's, he's a very busy guy. So I didn't even know if, if Hannes would end up doing the record prior to it because I knew how much he has on his plate. But the thing is for me is I, I just always want to play with the best. And with playing with the best means that those people are usually playing with other bands, other projects, other careers. Um, but with Hannes, I just knew that Hannes would do a fantastic job on the album. And, and he certainly did. I mean, when I listened to Upon Death with Sam, uh, you know, I, I pushed him hard to get the best out of him. Um, and I know that he's still capable of providing anything you could ask. And that's the interesting thing about working with Hannes is that, you know, I would just say, hey, how about this cymbal accent or this palm beat or this thing? And he was always open to suggestions. And only for like, you pretty much have him play anything at any time. You know, he just, he's like, oh, let me work on it. And then 10 minutes later, he's playing it already. <laughs> he's just that talented. And, uh, you know, Hannes did a fantastic job. And I, I couldn't be more proud of Hannes and JJ uh, for, for the contributions that they made to this album. You know, Hate Eternal's been around now for a little over 20 years. So how do you think that the band has progressed over the years to what you are now, Eric? Well, I think for Hate Eternal, you know, one thing is we've expanded a little bit every record we do. And um, something that's really important to JJ and I is always uh, kind of preserving the integrity of, of what Hate Eternal represents, which we're a death metal band. And um, But with that also, it's kind of adding new dynamics and, and expanding a bit is what really helps keep me inspired because I never want to repeat everything, you know, it's like, um, for me, every record is a unique entity, and I always want to kind of compose um, unique things and added elements and dynamics to the fold, and this being our seventh album, it just felt like um, we wanted to just expand a little bit more without losing um, kind of the soul of what Hate Eternal is in the band, but, you know, considering, you know, Jason and I We've been playing together now for over 10 years, and it's our third record together, and we push each other really hard to get the best out of each other. And, and to me, I'm, I'm blind to who writes what. I just want what's best and what fits mm-hmm. um, the overall vibe for the album. And, you know, JJ and I have a great chemistry and uh, a great uh, relationship, working relationship, you name it. And, you know, plus, of course, he's an Eagles fan. That's what <laughs> to the album now starting off with the cover art tell us a little bit about the cover art and the artist and and how it relates to the content of the album eric well ellie 
Billy Ron Cantor is the artist who's done, you know, boy, he's had a busy year this year uh, <laughs> with Christine and uh, Soul Sky. He's worked with Testament, Hate Breed, and a lot of other bands. And um, he, he did his furnace, and uh, we were really happy with how the cover came out from furnace as well as the album. And we just kind of wanted to expand from that in every way. And, um, you know, Alan Douch has mastered our records. Uh, he's been mastering my records for, you know, 15 years now. So I like that when I find a team, if it's not broke, don't no need, need to fix it. So mm-hmm. with Ellie Ron, I just knew after Infernus, I wanted to have him involved in this next record. Um, and with Ellie Ron, I give him a lot of creative, uh, kind of artistic freedom because to me, an artist should never be stifled regardless of, of what his, way of crafting art is, whether it's music, whether it's uh, visual, artistic uh, approach. And with, with Ellie Ron, I tend to have some really in-depth conversations with him, not only about the influence and inspiration behind the lyrics and music for the album, but just my life in general, what led me to being who I am and where I am. Um, and I think those in-depth conversations tend to give them an insight into what I'm going for. Um, in an artistic sense. So with Ellie Ron, I'll send them the pre-production and lyrics like six months in advance, whatever I have done at that time, and just give them kind of um, a synopsis of the overall vibe that I'm going for. And I just kind of let him run with it, um, you know, specifically with, with Upon Death of Sands. Um, and, you know, of course, when he... He just is one of these artists that just really put a lot of attention to detail and dives so deep into what he does, just like I do. I'm a pretty, you know, I'm a deep guy, you know, I'm, I'm a complex, deep person, and, and, you know, he's a very deep person as well, and I tend to work with a lot of people like that. We just kind of gravitate towards one another, and um, he sent me the original kind of uh, draft before he started painting it and putting it together, and and I just thought, wow, it was just, he had such a unique approach to his art that I think has this very uh, kind of Renaissance era vibe mm-hmm. to me. And, and that I really love the Renaissance era of, of, of um, art. And he uses that, I think, as inspiration um, amongst the lyrical concepts and kind of the musical vision that we present. And I mean, I... I love Ellie Rod. He's just such a fantastic artist, and I love the cover, and, and I'm so happy with how it all came out. So, Eric, tell us a little bit about the sound of this album musically, and if you tried any, like, different techniques in the recording process. Hmm. Well, the first thing we did uh, uh, that was a little bit different on this album is that we uh, experimented with uh, different tunings, which we've always had a C-sharp tuning since the beginning of Hate Eternal. Uh, we were C-sharp and ripping corpse, so I've kind of been C-sharp for, for a long time, with mm-hmm. the exception of Morbid Angel. Um, so uh, this time around, I wanted to add a little bit more of a gloomier, kind of gloomier, heavy um, vibe to the record. So I decided to resurrect my... I have three seven strings from my Morbid Angel days and decided to resurrect uh, one of my guitars and uh, tuned it to G sharp, which is basically the same tune, just with a seventh string, and just kind of see what I would create with it, and not really put pressure on on it either, because I'm just the person that kind of believes that you need to let things naturally flow. I, I you know, we don't tend to put too much thought into the um, direction of what we're going to go in. I just kind of let everything flow naturally based on what's going on in my life, the emotion that's behind it, things of that nature. And with the seventh string, I started work I started playing on it for months and nothing really came to me right away. And then all of a sudden, uh, one day I just kinda tapped into something and, and kinda went on a roll <laughs> for the three songs that are down to on the record. Um, which are upon Death with Sand, uh, nothing with the being and for whom we have lost and so that was one thing that I interjected into the record that was definitely different and added a nice dynamic um, and a, a blend of different kind of hills and valleys and, and a variety of uh, emotional kind of landscape, I guess, and musical landscape. And that was one thing we did different. I guess the other thing I, I told myself for this record, 
record is, uh, speaking with Hannes and JJ, is that this record was really uh, a guitar kind of uh, album as far as, like, there's just so much guitar involved, and I really wanted the guitar to shine on this record, and everybody agreed. And so knowing that, I just decided I was going to try different strings, different picks, different guitars, whatever it took to get the best tones, the best performances. Um, of course, I went with my Marshall JCM 800. It's kind of been my defining tone for a long time. Mm -hmm. Ended up doing all Marshall for rhythms this time around, which was different than previous records with the 800 and the JMP. Um, and then ended up using my 91 Gibson Explorer that I had from when I first uh, joined Morbid Angel. And I ended up doing my rhythm guitars for that. Uh, for the for the six string songs and my Iron Birds for the solos. So those are things like I used a different pick, different strings, just because I felt they sounded right. And changing your pick after, you know, I've been playing the same pick for 25 plus years now, but um, playing a new guitar in the record that I hadn't played in quite some time, new picks, new strings, all for the sake of trying to capture the best tone I could. Mm -hmm. I made a lot of compromises and sacrifices myself in order to do that. And, of course, the final result when I, you know, I listened to Pondes and Fans, it's, it's my favorite Hate Eternal production by far and, and, and really my one of my favorite guitar sounds I've ever been able to capture. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you, to get better, you just have to take risks. You have to push yourself. And my whole life and career has been based on taking risks, even at, um, at the risk of peril and, and also people saying, what the hell are you doing? You know, you sure you know what you're doing? And sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't, but I always am willing to take those risks. Mm -hmm. And for me, the, the major risks in my life and in my career have always paid off tenfold, and, and this is no exception. And Eric, what was like your inspiration lyrically behind this album? You know, it, in, in some sense, it was... Um, kind of a continuation, I guess, in a way from Infernus is that uh, for me, the last many years, I've had some tremendous losses in my family, um, and I guess music for me has always been a way of expressing myself in ways that I couldn't express otherwise in any type of positive fashion. And when I found music as a teenager and started playing guitar, it really saved my life in so many ways on giving me something to put all this negativity into something that was unique and creative. And that's why, you know, Hate Eternal for me, it's not just something I do because it's cool or it's, or it's fun or, 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 you know, it is cool and it is fun. But <laughs> this, this, the underlying meaning behind Hate Eternal is I, it, it's getting more therapeutic, if anything, for me uh, by being able to express myself musically and lyrically uh, with a lot of what goes on in my life. And I feel like every album and every song that I've written and the lyrics, they bring me back to a moment in time. Um, so in some way, you know, I use metaphors uh, a lot in, in a way, so it, it kind of gives the listener um, their own unique vision of what I may be referencing or the inspiration behind it. Uh, but I've always kind of done that who allowed lyrics to um, in some, sometimes poetically kind of express myself on some of my, I guess, my life experiences and things. And, you know, for the last, the last many years, I've just had a, a, a stretch where I've lost some people, uh, profound losses, um, that really um, made, you know, an impact on my life. And I just used that in order to kind of create lyrics and musical ideas. And for me, I guess it goes back to I'm a deep, passionate person. And um, as I've experienced much hardship in my life and gone through a lot of trials and tribulations and, and experiences that have altered my life, um, from 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 youth, I've used that to kind of um, express myself, and here I am. You know, when I think all these years later, I've been playing guitar for thirty something years, and I was just always so thrilled. 
driven because I knew that music was my my way of escaping so much of my um, I guess troubled um, childhood and things that happened in my life that I needed a way to to be able to conquer and and music has allowed me that and I when I look at my career and, and everything I've been able to accomplish it's just I've been so driven and always very ambitious but I think a lot of that just comes from the depth of of emotion from events in my life that have shaped who I am and everything I've done and and the lyrical content of a contest with fans is no different you know it's it just I use lyrics as a way to really express myself and uh, I've been writing lyrics for since I was probably 13 or 14 it's just something that um, such a great uh, balance between being able to create music and express myself that way and then create lyrics and express myself in that way I, I there's such a unique um, kind of meditative power almost by being able to express myself in both these ways and uh, I don't know if it's linked to me being a Gemini or something but I, I I, I always have to do like multiple things at one time. I'm never, and, and you know this, <laughs> trying to set up this interview, right? So, <laughs> right. You know, if I'm, you know, I sing and play guitar. I have a studio. I play in a band. You know, like I just always do multiple things. And by writing lyrics and music, it's kind of like the the full monty of expression for me. And and it's, it's so rewarding um, in so many ways. And, and actually, it's helped me establish a more positive and healthier life. Uh, mentally and, and physically by being able to express myself in this way. And Eric, you have a tour coming up too, so tell us a little bit about that. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, what a, I, I, I got to say how how fortunate I feel to be able to tour with, you know, Cannibal Corpse. I mean, we've toured together many times. Um, I've done four album productions with Cannibal Corpse, so of course, you know, to be able to tour with, with those guys is like touring with family and friends. And, you know, one of the, one of the um, best things I could possibly imagine is having our album come out Friday and then going on tour with Cannibal Corpse the following week. <laughs> I can't ask. There's, there's, if somebody said, what would be your perfect tour to go on upon the release of this record? Well, I got it. So um, <laughs> I'm very excited to be touring with Cannibal Corpse and Harm's Way and uh, five-week tour in America uh, with the release of our new album. And um, touring with those guys is, is an absolute pleasure. Working with Cannibal Corpse is an absolute pleasure. And getting to listen to them every night is an absolute pleasure. So uh, I'm a pretty happy camper about it, i got to be honest. And if people want to learn more about the band, what are the best sites to go to, Eric? Um, I would, you know, I with Eternal, you can always, you can always go to Facebook, um, if you want to hear a variety of music, you know, you can, I always say go to YouTube and put in internal, there's tons of stuff on there. Or our band, or our band camp page is another great place to go to. Um, any of those places are a great place to find out more about it. So there you guys go. Hate Eternal has a brand new album coming out in a, the 26th. That's a couple of days. I know. <laughs> really exciting, man. I, I, I'm really proud of this record. We really worked hard to, to get this album, and I'm, I'm super excited to, to release this to the masses. So it's called Upon Desolate Sands, and it's off of Season of Mist Records. And as always, Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show, taking the time to do this with us today, and best of luck with the new album and the tour, and uh, stay healthy out there. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me on once again, and... Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody on tour, and I will do my best to stay as healthy as I possibly can.